Did our ancestors think that their pictures or statues could come to life? That they could turn into a real being? And what would be the implications of this on their beliefs if they did think this? Today I'm going to tell myths about such a belief and we'll use some ancient stories from Algeria and Greece to show how we can age and find the source of this myth to show that this myth is very old indeed, going back tens of thousands of years. And so, if that sounds interesting to you, then grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Craig and Ford. The best place to start this investigation is with the story of the skillful hunter, a myth heard by Leo Frobenius during his stay in Cabelia in 1914. And this will allow you to understand the basic motif of the myth. And then we can investigate what we can understand about its age and source from what we know. A hunter had just married his third wife, a very beautiful woman, and he was completely infatuated with her. But after three days of marriage, the hunter had not left home to get any food, and his new wife told him that he needed to go out hunting and get some. The hunter refused, arguing that his wife was so beautiful that as soon as he walked away from her, he would not be able to resist the urge to go straight back to her. And so his wife made a drawing of herself and gave it to him. The hunter looked at it closely and exclaimed that this was so lifelike you are indeed alive for me here and in this picture. With the picture in his possession, the hunter left to find food and every time he was overcome with a deep desire to see his wife, he looked at the image he had of her. But then, the last time he pulled the picture out of his bag, a gust of wind pulled it from his hands and carried it far into the sky and out of sight. The hunter returned home as quickly as he could, and upon hearing the news, his wife was worried, saying that this was a warning of a misfortune to come. When the paper with the drawing on finally fell back to earth, it was very far from where the hunter and his wife lived, and it was found by a shepherd. And when he looked at it, he thought the image of it was, well, of the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She must be a real person, he thought, as the drawing was made in such a way that one really believed that it was a beautiful living creature. But he was just a shepherd and did not consider himself fit to find and marry such a beautiful woman. And so he took the drawing to his master, who would be more worthy. His master, who was also the head of the village, instantly fell in love with the woman in the picture. And so he went to hide himself in a room deep within his house and closed the door behind him. He put the drawing on a bench and there he became infatuated about the woman. He just could not stop thinking about her. He couldn't take his eyes off the image of the beautiful young woman and expected to see her open her mouth and speak. He truly believed that this engraving was none other than the living form of a young woman who would soon metamorphose in front of his eyes. With his eyes on the drawing, the poor man forgot everything about his immediate environment. He no longer thought about eating, drinking or sleeping. He didn't move from his room for a day and a night, waiting with infinite patience for the image to speak. The village chief had been gone two days and his lack of appearance started to cause a concern amongst the village's inhabitants. A wise old woman went to look for the chief and found him prostrated before the drawing, his eyes fixed on the image, immobile as if petrified. She decided to tell the village leaders, promising to make the chief come back in return for a large sum of money. She tried to force him to turn away from the image and finally stood between the image and the chief Whereupon the chief became furious and told her to go away, don't stop me watching this beautiful woman. She was just about to open her mouth and speak to me. The wise old woman then proved to him that it was only a sheet of paper by showing him the back of the drawing and seeing it was blank. But she then offered to find and kidnap the young woman who had served as the model for the drawing in exchange for a large sum of money. 
This story then tells of how the old wise woman found the hunter's wife and was taken into her house, how the old wise woman tried to kill the husband, which led to the hunter getting seriously ill, and then she abducted the woman to give her to the chief. The beautiful woman, in her fury and her, well, powerful rage, transformed herself into an ogress and then devoured every human who came near her. But meanwhile, the hunter's first wife had seen the danger her husband was in and managed to save him, allowing the hunter to then set off to rescue his third wife, which he succeeded in doing through a series of deceptions. I hope you found this story interesting. It's actually part of a longer tale entitled The Dexterous Hunter. And if you would like to know more tales like this, then for the English speaking amongst you, I can recommend The Voice of Africa, a two volume set of some of Frobenius's work. But if you speak German, then there is a three volume set called Volksmarken der Kaibeli, which means Folklores of the Kaibeli. Now, one thing to note when looking at ancient myths is to use caution when analysing any myth from a source of text. And that doesn't mean to validate how it's translated, but also to be concerned about its interpretation. You see, when looking at foreign texts, especially older foreign texts, there is an element of interpretation, as words used hundreds of years ago may well seem similar to words we use today, but could have had well, very different meanings when they were written, and translations themselves can be literal or figurative. And so we must understand that, that this story, which is an oral tradition in Kaibali, and it was translated and written down in French before being translated into German, before being retranslated into French, which is the version of text I have taken this story from, because, yes, there is also some of Fabinus' work in French as well. And then I have translated that into English. So basically, be careful of the language of any books you read when you are like, looking for them. Now, because of this, it would be sensible to assume that such a journey of translation may have changed the words in the story. But it would also be sensible to assume that it did not alter the story's core motif. And although some may think that's a risky assumption, one must remember that the substance of the myth is not found in its style or, or the syntax, nor in how the story is told, but within the story itself that is being told. And so if we feel the core of the story is accurate, then we can examine the culture and beliefs to try and establish an age of this myth, or at least its minimum age. So let us first consider why this story has cultural significance. Talking about a picture that is lifelike in North Africa, a largely Islamic region, is interesting because of the opinion Islam has on images. And if you aren't aware, then it is that there are no images in the Quran, as images are suspected of leading to the adoration of idols. And there are several Quranic verses that denounce idolatry and the worship of statues. But this isn't a purely Islamic view. We see this in the Abrahamic religions too, all of them, as how many images of God do you see in the Bible? And so, due to its influence on Islam, it should be of little surprise that this condemnation of imagery is consistent with the Old Testament, where you can read such lines as, you shall not make an idol, nor anything that has the form of what is in heaven above, on earth here below, or in the waters under the earth. And whilst some may point out that we do not see any Quranic verse explicitly rejecting painted images, the rejection of idolatry would have to include the rejection of the idolised object, which is more often than not an image or sculpture, which means that, in effect, the core motif of this myth can be considered as an anti-Islamic one. We must also consider the collective traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, held within the books of the Hadith, and this too corroborates this iconoclasm. Here, one of the traditions tells of when Muhammad, when seeing a cushion which was decorated with figurative representations, which was brought by one of his wives, well, he accused the artists of giving life to beings that they had created because they wanted to be equal to God. And with Islam's view that God alone 
has the right to grant existence and form to something that did not exist, all other creation must be viewed as competition. And so the painter has violated the divine right of creation. Now, Patrick Ringenberg, an iranologist, talks about this in his book, The Persian Painting. And this condemnation in the Hadith is explained further by Ringenberg, who said that by the psychological interferences of naturalist painting, a talent can impart a kind of vital magnetism to an image of man or animal. The psychological beliefs of these figures then easily arouse a conceptual or sentimental fetishism, apparently religious, but in reality largely dependent on an egocentric illusion. And then we have further evidence of this belief from the French artist Delacroix, who, on arriving in Tangier, noted that the Moors prejudice are very strong against the fine art of painting. And so, when we consider all of this, and then look back at the story from an Islamic perspective, based on divinity, the image adored by the village chief, which is almost living in its aspect, would lay somewhere between the divine and man. And if we can directly quote the story, or as best as we can considering all the translations, it shows us that the adoration the village chief had with the drawing had him prostrated before her, with his eyes fixed on the image immobile, as if petrified. And this is representative of idolatry, and so is rejected by our interpretation of the Quran. Now, if we then further considered that the story had a figure of an ogress, where the hunter's third wife transformed, then this must be a pre-Islamic figure for such creatures to not appear in Islam. And so, based on this analysis, then we could have no choice but to conclude that the myth was in existence before Islam, or more specifically before Islam came to North Africa, and so earlier than the 7th century CE. And this could be further evidenced as the other monotheistic religions that the Kybalis experienced, the Jewish and Christian, were also iconoclastic, and so they could not have inspired such a story. And this leaves the door open to the conclusion that this story is from a much older source. So where could this story have come from? Well, we do see the motif of the adored image in some stories from ancient Greece. So let's look at a few of these. First, we have a play written by the poet Alexis called The Painting, and it tells the story of Clisophius of Celebria, who had a similar passion. He was in a temple in Samos, and there he fell head over heels in love with a marble statue from Paros. And so he locked himself in the temple, hoping to make love to the statue. But after coming up against the coldness and resistance of the marble, it eventually made him give up his desire. But he had a passion running through his veins, and so intense was this desire that he took a piece of meat and made love to it. Then we see Athene de Nocretis write in the Dibnosophists uh, that a dog, a dove and a goose had been painted on separate paintings, yet each of these paintings was attacked, one by a dog, one by a pigeon and a third by a gander. These animals had such a passion they could not appreciate that these paintings were just paintings, but they did eventually give up. We see the existence of this myth also in ancient Greece, which is confirmed by Aristenity, who in the 5th century CE collated a large amount of ancient tradition in his work Love Letters, and in one he tells the story of a young painter who falls in love with his work, uh, with quotes such as the image does not lose its own form, she smiles softly, her mouth is slightly ajar, and I have listened very often. I invite the young girl to fight in love, she, like a courtesan who excites her lover, keeps silent. I laid her down on my diaper. I kissed her on her breast. The story concludes when the young painter finally realises his mistake and asks Aphrodite's children to give her a friend similar to his work of art, but endowed with a soul. But perhaps the most well-known version of this story is Pygmalion, told by Ovid in his work Metamorphoses. In this story, Pygmalion, who is a sculpture from Cyprus, considered women to be immoral and a source of sin, so he decided he would not be seduced by any of them. 
However, he worked for several months to carve a woman of idyllic beauty out of ivory, and he immediately fell in love with what he made. So much so, he adorned her with jewellery, clothes, and caressed and was tender with her. In fact, his love was so deep, he asked Venus to give him a young woman who would resemble his work. Venus fulfilled his wish by giving life and movement to the statue who he named Galate, and from their union a son, Paphos, was born. And so, if we combine the motifs of Alexis' play with a story by Aristenity, we can see that it has much in common with the Kybele story, and how a village chief falls in love with the image of a woman. And so, why are they similar? Are they from the same source? Did one influence the other? And when did this crossover happen? We know the myth dates from the pre-Islamic period, and we know Ovid was aware of it, which suggests it is now over 2,000 years old. But then we know the Kybelis and the Greeks met in very ancient times, and with the knowledge of Alexis' birth, then it would allow us to go back to date when the myth of the skillful hunter could have been written, so almost two and a half thousand years ago, or potentially much further back in time. And so let's look at another tale, again from the Kybele, and this is called The Fisherman and the Monkey. One day, a poor fisherman caught a box containing a monkey. His wife wanted to get rid of it. The monkey, that is, not the box. But the monkey talked her out of it, and he advised the man to buy bread and meat. The fisherman followed the advice, and when it was time to pay, his pockets were magically filled with gold coins. The monkey then advised him to get as many jars as possible and they filled with gold as the fisherman slept. From that moment on, the man and his wife lived rich and happy lives. But the man soon became bored. After all, he had everything he wanted. Or so he thought. And so this serves as a pretext for the second part of the story, which goes like this. One day the fisherman decided to go on a trip with his monkey as his only companion. He arrived at a village, and there the village chief was offering his daughter's hand in marriage to any suitor who could get her to talk. The fisherman hid the monkey under his top and went to the house that belonged to the chief of the village to ask for his daughter's hand. The chief accepted on the condition that the fisherman managed to get his daughter to speak by the evening. Otherwise, the fisherman would be executed. When the chief's daughter entered the room, the fisherman thought she was beautiful and was determined to marry her. She sat down opposite the fisherman without uttering a word, and half a day passed without him finding a way to get her to speak. He then had an idea, and squatted by her, so that no one could say for sure if any voice they heard came from the man's throat or his belly. And then the monkey started talking instead of the fisherman. And the monkey told this story. Oh, young lady, listen carefully and be honest with your thoughts. Once upon a time, there was a craftsman, a cabinet maker, who sculpted a tree trunk into the shape of a woman's body. This sculpture was so successful that it really would have been mistaken for a living human form. This skillful artist sculpted everything perfectly, the hands, the feet, the toes, the nails, even her long hair, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, the rest of the body. All so faithfully and precisely that you would have sworn it was a real woman in flesh and bone. One day, the sculpture exhibited this wonderful nude in front of his shop, and soon two rich merchants showed up, and they had much clothing and jewellery with them and they began to cover the statue's nakedness with the richest clothes that they bought and then adorned it with the most expensive jewels they had because the beauty of such a naked object bothered them and made them feel sorry for her. Shortly after, two other merchants arrived, seeing that the statue was well so well dressed and decorated with beautifully perfect jewels, they applied makeup to the lady. One of them blackened her eyelids, the other put lipstick on her lips. And... After this, a prophet came to pass by. He stopped and admired the almost human form of the statue and was so taken back by her charm and beauty 
It said, how unfortunate that such an attractive woman's body is not alive. And so he went up to her and breathed life into her. And at this point, the wooden statue came to life. She breathed, opened her eyes and fluttered her eyelashes. And the people in the market were shocked and ran away. Now, my beautiful young lady, said the monkey, remember to make a fair and honest decision. I asked myself, among all these men, the two wealthy merchants who dressed her, those who decorated her with makeup, or the prophet who gave birth to her, who do you think this now live woman belongs to? For my part, I would have opted for the artist, the creator, the sculptor, the young woman, until then dumb and immobile in front of the fisherman, jumped up and shouted, that's not right, only the prophet can claim the woman, because it was he who breathed life into her. It was indeed he who gave her the soul of a living woman. And it was then the woman realised that she had spoken, and recognised her defeat, and agreed to marry the fisherman. The story of the monkey has an element to it that can be related to the previously mentioned myths of Pygmalion as well as the other stories I've told in this video. Here an artist creates a statue that is beautiful and lifelike and it takes a religious element to give it life. But there are other similar elements, for example, whilst the statue does not talk in the Ovidian story, in the Kybele story it is the girl who cannot speak. But there is another element that is not obvious. For the fisherman to marry the daughter, it can make him the heir to the chief of the village. And the earliest forms of Pygmalion myth has Pygmalion as the king of Cyprus, the head of the island. All these add weight to the fact that the stories are linked, have a connection beyond the motif of a, a statue that comes to life. The chances that these myths developed independently of each other, well, that's really unlikely. And we can compare all the myths I've discussed here in a table and the similarities should be quite clear. In the Greek versions of the myth, and I will compare the Ovidian Pygmalion with the 5th century Aristenite version, we see an artist create a three-dimensional image versus an artist who creates a two-dimensional image, and so a sculpture versus a painting. In both stories the image seems alive and the artist falls in love with it and talks to the art. We then see Aphrodite grant the artist a friend that matches the artwork and the sculpture comes to life in the other but the painting seems to be replaced by a living person whereas with the Kybele myths of the skillful hunter and the Pygmalion version we again see a 3D image compared to a 2D image both which seem alive and we get the hunter losing the image so allows anyone to find it and see it against the theme where the artist freely shows it to everyone and then we see a village chief wanting her to be alive and a prophet who thinks it is regretful that she is not alive. And so, to end these stories, an old lady proposes to kidnap the woman, in effect, replacing the inert painting with a living thing, and a prophet that gives life to a statue. And so we see this transformation in both cultures, where a story of a three-dimensional image evolves into a story of a two-dimensional image, but the overall message remains the same, and again, this all reinforces that one group almost certainly borrowed the myth from the other. But how and when? The tale must have gone from Greece to Algeria or Algeria to Greece, and could have happened in the pre-Islamic conversion period. And we have academic agreement that Philostephophanus of Cyrene is a source of Ovid's work, and he lived at the end of the 3rd century BCE. And so this gives us two hypotheses. The first is that the Berber version would be a direct borrowing from that of the Ovid version, which would place this borrowing between the 1st century CE, the date of the writing of Metamorphosis, and the 8th century CE, the date of conversion of the majority of the Kybeles to the Muslim religion. Or the alternative view is that the Greek story would be a borrowing from the Berber culture to which the Kybele belong. Well, we know Metamorphosis was very popular when it was published, although the story of Pygmalion does not seem to be a story that was told often. And we can quote historic art critic Victor Liron Siokita, who said that there was no image of Pygmalion before the 13th century. 
the Pygmalionic imagination took shape and colour towards the end of the Middle Ages through a series of remodelling and reformulations. And we also know that the Ovidian myth was published when the Romans had influence over Juba II, who was the Berber king of Mauritania. But we should also look at the beliefs of the Berber tribes. And we know that from the 3rd century BCE, Jewish colonies were established on the Mediterranean coast. And in the year 320 BCE, we saw a massive arrival of Jews in Cyrencia, following the invasion of Israel by Ptolemy Sota, which included the deportation of more than 100,000 Jews to Egypt. And we also see the Jewish faith preached to the Berber tribes, especially in Cyrenaica. And from here, we see Judaism spread to the west and the south, across the Sahara, from oasis to oasis, settlement to settlement, so that in the 7th century, on the eve, at the time of the arrival of Islam, many Berber tribes were Judaized. However, as I've also mentioned, Judaism which is an iconoclastic religion, which means that where it was preached, the dispersal of such a story seems unlikely. And so we can have confidence that the story could not have spread before the 7th century CE with the spread of Judaism. And so looking at it from the side of the Berbers, we know that they did not have a close or long relationship with the Greeks, which makes the chances of the myth being borrowed directly from them unlikely. I mean, the Greek occupation of this territory probably began with Battus I, who ruled from the 7th century BCE, and ended with the legacy of this territory to the Roman Republic in 96 BCE by Ptolemy. The Romans later then granted it the status of a Roman province, along with the Greek island of Crete, near which Ovid sought some inspiration. And you must note that the Greek pantheon has made more than one loan from the Libyans in the Mediterranean, that these borrowings were probably not limited to just a few deities. But having pretty much ruled out the Greeks or Romans given the story to the Berbers, then we have to consider a different hypothesis. And that is that with the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians came in contact with the Berbers around 814 BCE with the founding of Carthage, and gradually adopted some of their beliefs. And we also see the Carthaginians and Cypriots maintaining close relations throughout antiquity. So we have the possibility of the adoption of the myth of Pygmalion by the Carthaginians, and then its diffusion into Greece via Cyprus. And I talk about such diffusions in my video on the origins of Venus. But this passage could not have taken place until 146 BCE, the date of the destruction of Carthage by the Romans. And in both cases, the contact period precedes the writing of Metamorphoses. Consequently, and until there is proof of the contrary, the loan seems to have come from Africa and into Europe. And so, if this is a myth from Africa, then was the boring of it localised? And so, specifically Kybele, or a more general one from the Berber culture. Now we know there was little direct contact between the ancestors of the Kybeles and the Greeks, or between them and the Phoenicians, as I've just discussed. On the other hand, a Saharan tale, which is still narrated by the Algerian Medes, tells of a child whose magic pencil gave life to a picture. And this story goes that the hero drew a bird and all of a sudden it shook his head, flapped his wings and flew away, disappearing above the walls. This story does also include narrative that figurative art is opposed to the Quranic teaching and concludes with the abandonment of such art in favour of the Quran. Now, could this be the myth surviving in a Muslim culture by being reversed? We also see in the Moroccan High Atlas images of big cats being frequently hit by weapons. Uh, but these images could just illustrate hunting, for example, such as the Mazai ritual of the lion hunt, during which a young hunter has to prove their courage and reaches adulthood by killing a lion. But equally, the weapons could be drawn because they were worried the lions would come alive. But... What is the possibility of a myth being transmitted over thousands of years? I mean, this myth, for example, you know, I've shown the possibility 
to reconstruct myths that are Paleolithic in origin, from creation myths and flood myths to dragon rituals. And so it isn't impossible to think that this Ovidian myth of Pygmalion has managed to survive to the present day, or for at least two and a half thousand years. And if we have found a version of it in the Kybli culture, then why not consider that it could have been preserved as a memory of a much older myth? And so let's go to a different continent, a continent that was isolated for over 10,000 years after humans found their way there. And that is North America. In 1909, John Swanton collected myths from the Tlingit culture. One story went that the widow leader, made unhappy by the loss of his wife, asked many artists to make a statue of her beauty, and no one succeeded. Then a famous sculptor proposed to reproduce his wife in a piece of cedar. He finished the work by dressing it with one of the disappeared women's dresses, and the chief fell very much in love with the statue and treated her like a real living being. For example, he would put on his wife's clothes on the statue, and one day he was even convinced that she had moved, and gradually the statue began to look more and more like his wife. But after a while, the chief heard her fall over and went to pick her up, and there he found that a shrub was growing under her. And since then, in the Queen Charlotte Islands, where the story takes place, when a tree is vigorous, it is said that it is a, as beautiful as the chief's wife's baby. The Shimshayan culture, who share their northern border with the Tlingit, say that a man sculpted a statue of his late wife, whom he loved very much for her sewing skills. He did it so that her fingers moved and that she would turn towards him every time he opened the door. He placed his work in front of an unfinished dance costume and treated her as if she were alive, pretending to talk with her, pretending she was asking questions and he would give answers. The news of this spread to the neighbouring village and one day two sisters fleeing their mother's anger, they caught him hugging and kissing the statue. So he invited them to dinner and there the eldest consumed too much alcohol and became very rude and the youngest was very discreet and ate politely. And so he decided to marry her and having committed to marrying again, he burned the statue. Now, there are other very similar myths in the region, particularly among the Bella Kula and the Nuktka cultures. And what is interesting here is that we see that the two variants of the story that are found in the Berbers and the Greeks, one a demiurge occupying a very high place on the social or divine scale, giving life to the image, acting essentially out of pity, and in the other, the image remains immobile, and thanks to an indiscreet speaker from outside, the statue of a real woman is finally replaced by a real woman. And so, the complexity of this transformation makes it very unlikely that independent versions of the same story have been invented. And so, with this story, being found in America, it is therefore probable it was taken there during the last ice age, so before the Holocene period. Now I have to admit the data is still insufficient to trace the dispersal route before it crossed into North America. Nevertheless, this does evidence the story as having a very ancient origin, an origin that is also found its way into the Berbers and was perhaps there before it traveled into North America. And so, it is worth mentioning that I often get challenged about why I don't say African myths are the oldest myths. And I have to say because we just don't have proof. There are no writings and a lack of research to show that any story is older than a thousand years old. But we also have to be honest and say the reconstruction of African history must use oral history. And so we must learn how to use these stories perhaps in new academic ways to help us understand these stories' origins and the early beliefs of African culture. And it is evidence such as this story, piecing together clues of the story's age due to cultural beliefs, the dispersal records, and the various styles of motif within the story that allow us to say with confidence that this is one of those very old myths.
If you want to understand more about ancient rituals we can recreate, then I can suggest you watch this video about dragon rituals from Paleolithic Europe. And I'll perhaps one day look at this myth further to show other ancient clues about it. But for us now, we can be sure there was a belief that images and idols could come alive. And this may have informed certain religious customs and beliefs, explaining why images are removed from certain religions in our culture today. And so I want to thank you for watching and my patrons for their support. And please stay safe and well. And this was Crackenford. <laughs>